Hi, everyone. It is uh, one o'clock. So I will go ahead and get started because we have a really packed agenda. I'm assuming people will keep um, logging on. So um, thank you all so much for being here with us. This is uh, Methamphetamine Practical Strategies for Harm Reduction and Client Engagement. And your speakers today will be me, Allison Newman, Susan Kingston, and then Peter Cleary. So just to orient you a little bit to Zoom webinar, I think a lot of us are now familiar with Zoom meeting. We're using the webinar platform. So only your hosts and panelists can share video and audio. So if you have questions, enter them into the Q&A or you can chat in the chat box. Um, also, just so you know, the webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it on our ADA blog uh, sometime later this week. So I just want to start by um, doing our land acknowledgement. I would like to begin by acknowledging that as we gather today, we are on the ancestral homelands of the indigenous peoples who have lived on these lands since time immemorial. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude for our indigenous neighbors. I also want to put our thank you for all our partners at the beginning of the webinar, because sometimes it feels rushed at the end. And I especially want to thank Peter Cleary and Project Neon for being here with us today. I'm just so excited um, to have you here and to have you as part of this work. I also want to say thank you to the people who shared their time and experiences with us so we could develop new and better health education materials for people who use methamphetamine. Thank you to our community partners who have informed this webinar and our work and for the work you do. And thank you to the Washington Healthcare Authority Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery for funding this webinar and our work. So our agenda, spend um, 10 minutes with introduction and data overview. Um, Susan Kingston will be talking about motivations for use, how to talk to someone using methamphetamine. And then Peter Cleary will talk about harm reduction strategies and what works. And then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions and discussion. So um, why are we doing this webinar? It's really a mix of things. One is that we have been hearing from people who use methamphetamine, either through our syringe exchange survey or through interviews we've done, that um, a lot more people are using methamphetamine and people have really complicated, complicated reasons for using it. We also see in our data that something is going on with methamphetamine. Um, so I'm gonna run you through some of the data to give us an overview of why we're doing what we're doing today. Oh, let's see. Um, so I just had a chat from someone, but I will deal with it in a second. Um, so starting with our mortality data. So we see we have a 600% increase in methamphetamine deaths in really the last decade. And about half of those deaths were meth and opioids and half were, were meth alone. Um, so this is really concerning data. M many efforts of the overdose epidemic have focused on opioids, but we can see methamphetamine is also an issue and really a growing issue. We also know from talking to people who use methamphetamine that many of them don't think that you can overdose on it. So trying to raise awareness of that issue as well. So in these deaths, what, what are the people who are dying from methamphetamine? What, what do we know about them? We know that depending on the year, about two thirds or three quarters were men. We know the average age in 2018 uh, was 47. So it's not super young people, um, not super old people, somewhere in between. Um, we know the race ethnicity, the large majority were white. However, American Indian um, Alaska natives are overrepresented as are black people. So if we look at the data quarter by quarter, um, we see psychostimulants with abuse potential, which is really methamphetamine deaths are increasing. Our overall drug poisonings are increasing and that cocaine deaths are starting to increase as well. And this is um, Washington State Department of Health data that my boss, Caleb Banta Green, put into a nice template for me. Um, and this, the last two data, points are available on our uh, WA data page on the ADAI webpage. So you should definitely check that out to get more granular information. So we're at, what are other hints of what we know? Um, from our Washington State Syringe Exchange Survey, we know that 84% of people we surveyed had used methamphetamine in the last three months, and that 49% had used it five to seven days in the past week. So that's a, a large proportion of people who are using methamphetamine really frequently. Um, and we know that about a fifth had used um, meth and heroin mixed together or a goofball in the five to seven days in the past week. 
The other thing that this data says is that it's not the people using methamphetamine or using heroin. Many people are using both in a similar time frame. So um, that is somewhat different than uh, past periods in drug use where there's really a lot of poly substance use. Um, and this, this data is also available on our website and definitely worth diving into a little bit more. Um, we also know from the survey, we asked people for the first time um, what some of the acute consequences of methamphetamine use that they'd experienced. And among those who'd used any meth um, in the past three months, 25% uh, felt like they were losing mind, manic, or psychotic while on meth. 15% felt like they're having stroke, heart attack, or seizure while on meth. And 9% had been to the ER for medical or psychiatric problems due to meth. Um, we also get a little bit of more uh, first-person information about why people are using meth from qualitative interviews we conducted in summer 2018. People talked about meth just helping them function. It's just like a cup of coffee in the morning, make sure I get up and get active and get some stuff done. Um, people talked about meth helping with opioid withdrawal, saying if you do use meth and you're sick from heroin, it usually takes care of the pain. And then also just saying that meth is very available saying they've kind of gone hand in hand. Everyone that's doing heroin is doing meth. So you've got your meth and dealing and also to be able to keep up. Um, you can get your next fix and not go to sleep until you're dope sick. So this just gave us a, some basic information about what was going on with people who were using. So I was so hoping we would have our um, methamphetamine overdose brochure available. It will be released later this week. Um, we conducted informal conversations with people with past or present methamphetamine use about how to respond to stimulant overdose and what language was appropriate. And we also spoke with medical providers, harm reduction, EMS, and housing providers about what they felt like the appropriate response was. So just wanted to alert you that that will be released uh, later this week. So that is all for my data piece. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and hand it over to my colleague, Susan Kingston. Okay, who's trying to unmute? All right, good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody see all right? Allison, can you tell me if that's looking good? Looking good. All right. Okay, great that everyone is here. I'm so excited that we're hosting this webinar. We've had a lot of interest in this. Um, so thank you for sharing an hour with us. So my name is Susan Kingston. I currently work at ADAI, but during the previous meth wave of the late 1990s and 2000s, I was working at Public Health Seattle and King County as their point person on interventions and training and education around methamphetamine. And I also worked at Stonewall Recovery Services for several years, providing harm reduction, um, and recovery support counseling uh, exclusively for people who were exploring or trying to quit uh, their meth use. So today I just wanted to share with you some of the lessons that I learned from that earlier period that might be useful as we face this current wave of methamphetamine use. Um, given also some of the information that Allison has shared that we have a very different situation going on with methamphetamine in terms of the number of fatal overdoses and that are involving methamphetamine and the amount of poly substance use that we have going on. So to me, as we talk about this phrase engagement, I think what we really mean by that is that we are trying to connect with a person in a space of trust. And I'm for luck, I'm going to use the term client today. And I know many of you are working in medical settings where you may use patient, but I'm going to use client. So we're really trying to connect with a client in a space of trust. And we're trying to build relationships in where that person feels really valued and respected. And to do that in the context of methamphetamine, it can really help to understand how meth affects behavior, why and how a person might use meth. And, and how to have conversations that support this connection. Today, we won't get into more clinical topics like differential diagnoses between methamphetamine psychosis and schizophrenia or really specific treatment modalities, but watch for future webinars on these topics. There are definitely many in the works. 
I also want to say up front that we have a really big group of participants here today and you and you come from a very diverse um, backgrounds, professional credentialing and settings. And we have had so many questions already and requests of what can we cover in this webinar? And we just won't be able to cover every idea or opinion or issue around this topic. So really consider this webinar an introduction to this issue. Um, and I, I also want to say that we, if you have other questions later on in the webinar, we're going to ask for your input on what webinars topics we should have in the future. So keep that in mind if your favorite topic isn't covered um, as in detail as you'd like today. So we all know this philosophy of um, meeting people where they're at, right? We know this philosophy and we believe that we, we do this in our work. And I think it's really helpful that before we even do that, we know where we are at. And I might have a lot of experience with methamphetamine and feel really comfortable with it. Maybe meth freaks me out and I don't know anything about it and I don't understand it and I really don't feel comfortable with it. All of that is fine wherever you are. Um, just remember that our attitudes about this and our beliefs about methamphetamine really impact how we might see someone else's experience with this. Um, and the, our words and our reactions and our objectives that we bring into client relationships really start here with us. And they really shape how engageable we are um, in these relationships. And I also want to really emphasize this point right now, and at this particular point in our current methamphetamine wave, because I believe what we're entering now and what I'm already seeing is what I call the methamphetamine empathy gap, where we have just come through a period of addressing opioid overdose. And I saw a rise in empathy for people who use substances like I have never in my whole career seen before. And some of that was because we had folks, we had someone else to blame for a lot of the opioid overdose and um, use problems that we have today because it was easy to blame third party prescribing, right? For causing this opioid crisis. We also have a handful of medications that make us feel like we have, we have something that we can do about it and we have ways of helping people. And so I saw empathy and understanding skyrocket during these last few years and that's a wonderful thing. However, as we enter into methamphetamine, neither of those conditions is true for methamphetamine. And I'm concerned that we are going to return the blame and the burden on this back to the person who's using methamphetamine. And I, I'm beginning to hear it in meetings. I certainly hear it from people who are using that I interact with. So I just want to bring awareness to that. And how are you feeling about methamphetamine versus how you felt about working with people with opioid use disorder or people who use opioids? And if it's different, acknowledge that it's different and just be aware of how that's influencing the way that you enter into these relationships. Okay, so this is what a typical use cycle looks like for methamphetamine. There's this initial flood of dopamine that's caused by methamphetamine that can be felt really quickly. And it lasts about four or 12 hours or even longer if you keep the run going with repeated administrations. Once the drug wears off, the body and the, the brain experience this recovery period that's often called the crash, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in a minute. But the key takeaway here is that people are gonna be high for a while, and then they're gonna be out of commission for a while. And this cycle impacts how often and when you might have opportunities to engage with a person. And I, I think that Peter will probably talk a lot more about this in his segment. Well, I want to share with you now the understanding how methamphetamine um, affects the brain. And for me, this really unlocks a lot of the mystery about how people experience methamphetamine, 
what they do while they're high or what they don't do or what they can't do, either when they're using or when they're recovering from methamphetamine. So this is really key information and it really affected so much of, of how I approached things um, years ago. So methamphetamine travels in the brain through what's called the mesolimbic reward system, um, which is a reward circuitry in the brain that's implicated in a lot of drug addiction. And methamphetamine is no different, except that the, the impact that methamphetamine has on dopamine is significantly different than other drugs of abuse. So what happens is that methamphetamine causes your ventral tegmental area, that VTA, to flood with dopamine. And that's your feel-good chemical, right? So you have all this euphoria, you have all this energy, you're really, really feeling good. It travels, those messages then travel into the nucleus accumbens, and that's really plays a role where your brain starts to make these connections that I did this, I feel good, this positive reinforcement. That's really the, the center of the reward circuitry there. Then methamphetamine travels up through the prefrontal cortex, and that's your area of executive functioning, right? That's where you make decisions, you assess risk, you're able to understand consequences of your actions, make judgments, and so forth. So when methamphetamine is in that area, it's really dysregulating the brain's ability to override powerful, powerful stimulus from other parts of the brain. And so you see very poor impulse control. You see um, decisions that don't make sense at all. Um, people's inability to really assess risk um, and think through consequences. So when you understand these areas of brain involvement, you can understand why being high on meth really feels the way it does, right? Like in addition to the euphoria and the excitement and the energy you're feeling from all that dopamine, meth is at the same time dysregulating your rational thought, your perception of risk, and your decision making. It's also overstimulating areas of the brain like the amygdala that regulate your fight, flight, um, and freeze response. So there's just a lot going on in a brain that is under the influence of methamphetamine. People may also experience disruption in their perceptions, and have hallucinations, paranoia, and, and even psychosis, which we'll talk also a little bit more about in a minute. Now there's, there's one common manifestation of meth use that um, I get questions about all the time. So I just thought I would mention it here today. And that's this issue of um, skin picking and speed bumps and I, I speed bugs. And I wanna mention it here uh, because it really, it shows you what the brain is making somebody do um, with methamphetamine. So methamphetamine uh, restricts your veins. It shrinks your veins. So this vasoconstriction causes this tingling and itchy feeling that you get. And on methamphetamine, all of your senses are heightened, including your sense of touch. So you have, um, you have this sensation, you're having a hypersensitive reaction to that sensation um, on your skin. And that leads to a, what's called a tactile hallucination or formication, which is at the belief that bugs are underneath your skin. And it's a, it's a real thing. This experience is a real thing. And so dopamine also plays a role in your fine motor skills and compulsion. And it can cause the person to have stereotyped repetitive behavior. So you're doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's dopamine. Um, and so on meth, you have this tactile sensation of bugs under your skin. And you've got this dopamine that's got your motor skills and your inability to sort of stop doing things compulsively. You start picking at your skin to get the bugs out. So this is what leads to the, to the red sores and the scabs that you often see on, on people's arms and on their faces. And to me, that's people would not normally do that without methamphetamine. So you can see how powerful this drug can be just in this one particular activity. 
So in addition to flooding the brain with dopamine, meth also prevents your brain from sort of reabsorbing the excess. And so to compensate for that, your brain just start, stops producing dopamine. So that when the effects of methamphetamine wear off, a person's dopamine stores are actually depleted. And so this leads to a period that is sometimes called the, the crash where your body is worn out from being awake and being active for so long. And without enough dopamine, you feel irritable, you feel sluggish, depressed, you are physically and mentally wiped out. And in some people, this is actually the phase where they feel even more paranoia or more intense paranoia or psychosis because it's uh, exacerbated by sleep deprivation on top of the methamphetamine. So during a crash, a person could sleep for several days until they return to their, to their baseline or until they use methamphetamine again. So you know, in other words, you are not likely to see this person coming into your office during this time. They need this recovery period. So here are some practical tips on how to adapt your service approach to accommodate some of the impacts that meth has on the brain. You know, people often have very disrupted perception of time or the ability to manage time, you know, getting caught into in these loops of repeating things. Um, so making and keeping appointments is can be really challenging for folks. So you will have more success if you have drop in hours, if your intakes are really brief and your waiting times are really, really brief. You have flexible no-show policies. Mornings are a no-go, folks. Mornings are generally a no-go. It can also help if your agency has, a, it has multiple services, like being able to one-stop shopping for folks if they've made the effort to come in to your office, providing as many services as you can in a short period of time, just expedited and streamlined as much as possible. It's really helpful. So, Meth also reduces attention spans and it impairs cognitive functioning. So in my office, I always had a fidget basket that had toys and gadgets that people could play with to help them stay focused while we were talking. I always had water, always had snacks. Um, I used a lot of reminders. I wrote everything down for folks over and over and over again. It also helps to keep your action steps, what you want people to do or what you're asking them to do, keep them simple, concrete, and very, very short term. Um, it's not, it will be frustrating to give someone a long list of things to do or things that they need to remember a few days from now. If the shorter time period, the better. Um, I also discourage from focusing too many of your messages on risk. Again, that perception of risk is really, really dysregulated and it can be, it, it just can go over people's heads or just not at all like connect for them. And don't assume that you can't talk to somebody who's high. Actually, there are many people when they use methamphetamine, they actually get more focused and they function better um, on methamphetamine. Somebody in the crash period, it's tricky. It's, it's tricky. It's not impossible. Um, so you just have to, you know, take your chances, have your opportunities, take advantage of them wherever you can. And conversations can get tangential with folks. And it's don't be afraid to just kindly, excuse me, kindly interrupt and be prepared to just re, be redirecting often with folks. And again, keep your conversations limited to really, really one or two topics if you can. So another sort of hallmark manifestation of methamphetamine is this experience of paranoia. And it's one that is often very worrisome for providers um, who are unsure about how to handle it. So again, not everyone who uses meth has paranoia. Some people begin to have these experiences early in their use. Sometimes it comes later in their use. But even if the onset of it varies, the presentation usually doesn't. It's generally about persecution. Someone is following me. Someone's trying to, someone's watching me. Someone's getting into my house and someone is messing with me in some way. Now, if you stop using meth, these episodes will resolve, but if you start using it again, they can often come back and come back quite quickly. So again, 
remember that your goal here in engagement is to establish trust and connection. And this is really challenging with somebody who's feeling really fearful and really distrustful. So my best advice to you is to not get caught up in trying to prove or disprove the details of what that person's experiencing. It almost never works and almost always frustrates both of you. So I would say, however, that you can distinguish between reality and their experience without denying the realness of their experience. So instead of saying, I know you hear voices, but they're not really there. You can affirm the person's experience by saying, I understand that you hear voices. I don't hear them, but I know that you do. And then ask them what you might say or what you might be able to do to help them feel safer. And always do your best to try to look past any behaviors that might be strange or even embarrassing for the person, as long as those behaviors aren't harmful to yourself or to the person. Um, this is a brain that's really hijacked and we wanna be able to preserve people's dignity when they're in that compromised condition. <clears throat> Excuse me. So despite all of these downsides of meth use, people have a lot of reasons why they might wanna use meth or why they like using meth. And the two main reasons, which are pretty much true for most drugs, is that people want to feel good or they don't want to feel bad. Um, and they do have a lot of personal connection with them. So the key here is to understand that meth has benefits. Um, as destructive as it may be, meth has benefits and they are important and valued those those benefits are important and they're valued by the person who is, is using. And if you know what that person's benefits are, then you also have good insight to what might keep them from stopping their meth use. And that's what I mean by like a motivation to use can be a disincentive to stop using. They're very often related. So another unique feature of methamphetamine is this idea of it being a functional drug. Because the high is so long, people often use it to perform a specific task or to function, like to work at their job or to lose weight or stay awake for certain reasons. There are things that some people really like to do when they are using meth. And this sense of I can get things done often reinforces that use even if over time, that sense of productivity really doesn't become very, very productive. So take the time to really explore this with folks um, and understand if and how this idea of functionality um, plays a role in somebody's meth use. Again, this is gonna give you really valuable insight into the person's life into what perhaps might motivate them or not motivate them to quit meth. And it even can help you anticipate what might be a relapse trigger down the line. If somebody is starting a recovery process with methamphetamine, it's often that sense of what they miss or what they feel like they can't do anymore that can be a real trigger for relapse. Okay, so now let's talk about conversations. And I know that everyone on this webinar is a kind, compassionate and helpful person, but talking to another person, especially someone in a professional role or somebody that is in a position of privilege can be really hard. And people who use drugs face constant judgment about that drug use from every, corners, every corner of their life, day in and day out and people are used to veiling their drug use for very understandable and legitimate purposes. So, and it can be really hard to trust and open up to someone who you think is gonna judge your drug use as something that needs to change or to stop when you aren't necessarily ready to change it or to stop it, or you feel like drug use is the actually the only thing that's holding your life together. So, and when you think about what your situation, life situation is complex, which many of the folks we work with come 
with very, very complex life situations. Imagine how hard it must be to start deconstructing that when you're in a brief intake and having to answer routine questions that may feel really routine to a provider, but only scratch the surface of what is really going on for somebody. And it can be hard to, you know, feel like you have to educate a provider about what meth is all about, or, you know, try to understand my, my life here for a second. And people often carry a lot of shame. So add to all of this, you add a brain that is not working at its best. And we can understand as helping professionals how our demeanor, our intentions and our words and our actions are so important in helping somebody feel safe and accepted and willing to connect with us. So this is just a short list of words and phrases that might seem really common to us and even standard in some of our professional circles. But when you see them here together collectively, you can maybe start to appreciate how it must feel to hear words like this or phrases like this said about you and your drug use and your life. Um, so to the ear of somebody who uses drugs, these words sound like rejection, blame, disrespect, even if the person uses these very same words themselves, it's really different when someone else uses those words. And the, that last bullet there, there's no treatment for mess, uh, which I should put in quotes, we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So this is my, my own go-to list of stigma-free converse, uh, conversation starters and questions that you can use to help get to know a person and their relationship with methamphetamine and how it fits into the context of their lives. Yeah, this I'm giving really you like a two minute warning because okay. we have a lot of questions coming through. And I want to make sure we answer them. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll keep moving because everybody's going to get... Uh, copies of these. So I want to say that we have to match somebody else's stage of change, not get them to move to yours. And so the, um, one way to avoid this misstep is to not start with thinking about treatment. You really want to instead get their sense of what their relationship is to their drug use, if they're even interested in changing their use, then you can talk about how they might want to go about that. Uh, these are some of, again, some of the reasons people might not want to stop. Again, any, any behavior change means a loss of those benefits. And so this is another reason why understanding what people get out of their methamphetamine use gives you a really good idea of what might be keeping them fearful about quitting. At the same time, people do come to the point of quitting. And these are often some of the, these were some of the most common reasons that I heard from folks that, you know, they're getting worn out, their bodies are worn out, they're, they feel out of control, they feel shameful about behaviors that they've done while on methamphetamine. And, you know, police involvement does, can be impactful for folks. So I just want to leave with this final message about um, spreading a message of hope that people can recover. So we're hearing a lot right now this phrase that there's no treatment for methamphetamine. We hear this a lot in the media. We hear it a lot in other training webinars. We even say it ourselves. And I know what we really mean is, is that we don't have a collection of medications that have widespread efficacy like we do for opioids. I, I know that's what we really mean by that but it can often be misinterpreted to mean there is that meth use is not treatable and that people cannot recover from methamphetamine use. And so I urge all of you to be really careful in your language when you're talking about medications and to keep a few things in mind. People do recover from methamphetamine use and they use a lot of different ways to do it. Medications, there are many that are being studied and we're not talking about them here today, but they do help some people. A lot of people don't need any other outside kind of help. They self-manage and quit on their own. Some people are gonna need and try a lot of different things. Um, but above and 
beyond we need to we need to encourage people they need to hear that it is absolutely possible and people do recover from methamphetamine use all the time so i'm going to turn it over right now to peter cleary thank you everyone thank you um well that kind of can everybody hear me okay yes okay um that kind of uh, uh, takes some of the wind out of my sails. You guys covered a lot of the things that I was all prepared to get up and, and uh, razz about, um, which is actually a very good thing. Um, it is really nice to see some of the change in um, providers' points of view, and it is not as adversarial as it used to be, um, which is amazing. But before I get too much into that, let me... Um, um, start with who I am and all that sort of thing. I, I probably was asked to be here, I'm guessing, because um, of a, somewhat of a unique perspective, I think. If I can share a screen here, there we go. Um, okay. Um, so, and one more clip, there we go. So um, I am the, um, uh, program uh, coordinator for Project Neon, which um, has had a delightful and long career um, being harm reduction in, in this town since 93, actually. So um, it is a loose acronym, acronym and uh, it was originally um, funded for an HIV prevention project. And it stayed that way for much of its uh, history. We still care about HIV prevention, of course, and Hep C and, and all the others, but uh, we are funded by the state now, and so we are drug user help. Anyway, um, they, so um, it is a peer-led and community-based uh, outreach program, so I work with people who use and um, every day, and I uh, also inject drugs. So. Um, it is not, it is with, um, and I am somewhat unique. I don't fit most of the profile. I get that. But um, I bring that up because it is important to know that lots of people don't fit into that neat category that, that w has been explained earlier. And those people do exist, but they don't, they're not the only ones. Um, also, I think something that is unique right now is that um, uh, there's a lot more going on. It was touched on earlier about how it used to be opioids in one camp and, and meth in another camp and how they're, they're colliding. Well, and that is true, but there's also a lot of different reasons for using. And somebody who is using uh, methamphetamines for survival um, as a way to keep their things safe or their body safe or to because it's cheaper than food, have a very different presentation or, or experience I would, um, than somebody who's doing it to have sex for four hours um, or whatever. So, um, so it, it, it further complicates this whole issue, which was already complicated enough, thanks. Um, so that's a little bit more about what uh, NEON does. And um, uh, it is, uh, like I said, I think all of this has already been covered. Um, uh, much better than I was going to, I'm sure. Uh, the thing to, about harm reduction for me, and I, I guess I did make some points as, as I was going on. The thing about harm reduction for me is I take it in a very literal sense. Um, most people, when you say harm reduction, they immediately think clean syringes and, and that sort of thing or, or um, recovery and getting people to cut back or quit um, use. And I find that when you approach harm reduction um, uh, by reducing harm in everything, anything that you can do and attach to that person, it does a couple of things. Obviously it makes them better and healthier, but it also, um, it allows them some to, um, their self-respect grows, their self-esteem grows. A lot of people do very damaging things to their bodies, uh, partly because they don't understand the risk or they um, are disjointed from the risk, but also um, because it, it doesn't matter. 
and um, if they are aware of the risk. So anything that you can do to take that edge off and, and give that person some uh, uh, you know, reason to do it is a great thing. Um, also, uh, um, it also uh, builds trust. So uh, that's about the quickest way to build trust is besides some of the other things mentioned, but is to um, be a be a partner in their drug use. And I know that sounds really weird. And, um, but if you can be on their side, so often uh, providers come to it. And by the way, so do users. We are just as culpable in this whole mess as, as the providers are. We um, automatically assume we're going to get mistreated. So we don't go to the emergency room until, you know, the abscess is, has our leg almost falling off. We don't, we assume we're going to get uh, nailed when we walk in the door. So we then behave in a way that we get nailed when we walk in the door. So, um, so we are just as culpable, but um, uh, uh, if you, if you get on their side and you are a partner in their drug use, then you become trusted. You, um, they will listen a lot better. Um, they will be willing to try something, even if it sounds really icky, <laughs> uh, because they're going to lose their benefits or they're going to lose their. Uh, they're, they're like, well, hey, you know what? They were they were with me through all this, so I, I will give them a, that benefit of the doubt. So. Um, the um, and even most of the myths and misconceptions were covered previous. Um, I think a couple of really important ones are that nearly impossible to fatally overdose. That is still very um, believed very potently. I think probably on both sides of of the um, of the you know the, the camps there. Even in uh, with my volunteers who. I've showed them the data, they've seen the data, they've watched that you know, graph go up and up and up and up. They still don't realize that there is uh, you know, a chance of overdosing. And I would, uh, I would have to guess that it is because it's not so evident as it is with opioids. I mean, very often when somebody uh, overdoses on opioids, they just, and, um, and there's a lot more going on, I, uh, as I understand it, with when you overdose on on um, uh, speed or whatever, because yeah, there's a lot more going on, and so it's not quite as obvious. Um, and I think um, it's also really important to uh, recognize that people who are using drugs, any drugs, um, can still make positive. Uh, solid decisions about their life and and they can do it from a very informed point of view um, it, it is it is that is probably the only thing that frustrates me or the thing that frustrates me the quickest is when people assume that because I have uh, because I am in current drug use that I am incapable of holding a 40 hour a week job which I do uh, making appointments which I do you know, all, um, all the other things, but there's a trick to that. So, um, but anyway, so, um, how do I say this? The, a lot of these myths are still built on, on, you know, reality. The, the people that were being um, described earlier by my two very wonderful um, co-hosts have, um, those, those people are out there and they're very real. Um, but I think with the with the type of use changing, there's also going to be different, um, uh, you know, uh, users. Definitely. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay. Um, there is also um, one of the things that I usually like to tell people about. Um, about meth use is, or drug use in general, is there is this difference between drug use, drug misuse, and drug abuse. And those are three very different things. And um, uh, you can misuse drugs and cause a lot of, wreak a lot of havoc in your life without having an addiction issue, without having uh, an abuse issue. 
So um, I think that is where, and, and I think this bias again is on both sides, both the provider and the client. Um, they think if they've used, then they're automatically an addict, they're automatically, you know, fall into these categories. And it, it is, can be very detrimental when you're trying to provide services and help um, this individual if they already believe that they are in a place that they really are not. So um, again, that continues to make the, uh, the process a little bit more difficult, but. Um, and as again, as mentioned, trust is definitely uh, the, the way to do this. I, I would probably add that um, so very often it seems that um, when drug use comes into the picture, that that is the big focus. That is sometimes the only focus. And um, again, it's not been my experience because I've had really wonderful doctors, but, um, but I hear it enough that I know it is, uh, it is an issue. For a lot of people, you may see it as a big issue and it, and it may very well be. And, um, but the person, to go a little bit farther than what was mentioned earlier, the person is not only doesn't see, doesn't, um, their brain isn't working as well. And they're, so they're, you know, perception of, of uh, consequences and that sort of thing are off, but they also might view it as a very small portion of what makes them them. Whereas I think a lot of times providers look at it as, oh my gosh, this is a, this is a drug user. Well, he's also white and, you know, male and cisgendered and, and creative and, you know, a gazillion other things. And so um, I think as soon as that comes into the picture, I think a lot of people um, uh, just stay there. And there's other things to, you know, um, that you can work with and help, help with, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the, um, the other thing with that is, um, uh, again, I'm looking for words, the best words for it. Um, um, yeah, I'll come back to that. I am, am a little, oops, what did I do? I apologize. You can just hit a back one and you should be able to go back. Just hit the back arrow. And if you can't, I can pull your slides up. Yes, please. Oh, okay. uh, no, I can be out of them. They're, they're pretty much gone. Um, <laughs> The, um, uh, one of the things too is, is that if they can make a decision and if we can, um, um, you know, show up for the, for whatever that you're um, engaged in, ask them for the directions. Nobody knows that person as well as they do themselves. Ask what they want let them lead the whole process. And if recovery is not on the list, don't make it on the list. It will either naturally get there on its own because uh, you know harm reduction, if you are reducing harm every day, just the one little step, it will get there on its own or it is not an issue that needs to be worried about. Um, it, again, this is a personal experience, but when I was um, smoking, my doctor was a hell of a lot more concerned about my nicotine than my meth use um, because one was out of control and was causing, you know, getting stages of emphysema and the other was not out of control and was not causing direct health risks. So, um, so let the person really um, lead and, and, um, and trust that they will do the right thing. Nobody starts out, in, you know, on the street or or whatever. Um, people get there, and they can get back from there. Um, and that is uh, leads me to one last thing that I kind of had jotted down. Um, that I think a lot of times meth use, I think poverty and um, and not feeling very safe in one's environment gets mistaken for meth use and vice versa. Um, there are people out there that are paranoid and 
freaking in the heck out and are homeless and are dirty that aren't using that. Um, but would you see them on the street? I have been guilty of this myself. I automatically assume that there, uh, you know, that there's drug use going on. So there, they are certainly there's a lot of intersectionality between our homeless issue right now and our drug uh, issue right now. But they are not inseparable, and they can be um, served singularly. So, um, and I think that's about it. I am. Um, Check my notes here real quick. Yeah, I think that's about it. I, like I said, it was covered very well by Susan and, and Allison. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's about all I have. I think we can open it up for questions. All right, thank you so much, Peter and Susan. I really appreciate your emphasis on talking to people as whole people, asking them what they want and trying to work with them to identify goals and how, how to improve their own lives or find out if they even want changes in their lives at all. So I meant to do a poll at the beginning to find out who was in our group. Um, I'm gonna launch that real quick just so we find out a little bit about who was here. Um, and then, then we'll get into questions. So just feel free to answer a little bit about who you are and then we'll share that. Um, sorry for not doing that sooner. <laughs> um, Wow, lots of votes. I'm going to go ahead too and start to share um, my screen with just our resources on this. Um, and then we'll dive into questions. So this is just me and Susan's contact information. And then also the, all the slides will be shared on our ADA blog along with the recording. And here are links to the different resources that I mentioned. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, I'll end polling soon. It looks like it's sort of ticking off. So um, I'm going to end polling now because most people seem to have answered. So looks like I put in health educator because that's what I am, wanted to include it. We have a mix of syringe services employee, government employee, substance use treatment provider, housing provider, mental health provider. Just a real mix all across the board, which is fantastic. So oh, I, now I'm sharing the results. Sorry, this is my first time doing polling. Um, I see someone raise their hand. If you could just enter that into the Q&A, we have a lot of questions and I wanna make sure that we get to all of them. Um, so I don't know if I'll be able to answer questions that way. So um, Susan and Peter, do you want me to ask questions and you can answer them? Um, we had one question pretty early on, I think would be great. So, so how would you flip that? I get so much done, clean the house, keep it all together for my kids. How do you flip that to being a reason to not use? How will they ever get as much done? Um, how do you flip that? I think uh, by closely examining what actually does happen and allowing them to come uh, again, more come to the decision themselves that yes, I was up for 28 hours, but I really only got the dishes done and that's it. Um, they will be very clean, but that's, uh, that's all you manage. And I think, um, I think when um, people start realizing and taking a look at, at their, um, if they can document it, it sometimes can even be helpful if you can get somebody to document it, start time, end time, that kind of thing. Um, there is one thing I did forget to mention and it kind of ties in here is have a plan before you use. If you uh, commit to um, a, a list of activities before you use, you are almost surely going to um, keep that, that list going because your brain, we already know it gets so unwired, it can't make a decision. So it just blindly goes with the direction you set for it. So if you're very good about setting a very um, strict parameters, as a matter of fact, you can actually sleep while you're high. It's not the best rest, but it is some rest. Um, but you have to convince yourself to do that before you get high and then you're fine. So um, it's always, I uh, always tell people have a plan. If, if you're having an issue in your life, figure out what that issue is, take a look at it, and then um, have a plan of attack and then do your drugs. Um, I have another question that I think would be useful for a lot of people. Um, thanks for the information. Any tips for providers for how to suggest, talk about harm reduction strategies when clients want to be completely abstinent but continue to use? So how to, I think that's a great question. <laughs> 
um, for me. I um, I think uh, I think that's unrealistic. Um, I think if you are hell bent on uh, complete abstinence um, and you cannot get there, I think um, I think that that is. I think that needs to be looked at again and encouraged to look at. It's okay to use, um, yeah, well, again, because it sets it up as a, a pass fail or a, you know, I did good or I didn't do good. And, and you, you need to take that element out of it as much as possible and encourage them to be okay with that. Um, that uh, reducing their use or maybe changing their modality of use or, you know, these other things is just as valid and on the road to, to recovery. You can have that as a big picture, that's fine, if you need to, but it's the little steps. So concentrate on the little steps. There are I mean, I think we have more questions that we're gonna be able to answer, but maybe Susan has something else to add. Well, I say I agree with every single thing that Peter said. And I'll also add that there, there are real phases that people go through once they quit once you start abstinence from methamphetamine. The two weeks after that are really different than the six weeks or the two months after that. And that's really different at three months. And so the, the issues that people face at these different phases um, are really different. And you can, and this is another webinar topic, but you can work with folks um, to help educate them on what these phases are and how they can prepare themselves to face the challenges that each phase brings. But again, that's another webinar. That's a plug. And we have so many questions. I'm really sorry, we, we are not likely to get to all of these, but um, I will get these recorded and Susan and Peter and I will make sure that we are able to respond to email for the ones we're not able to answer right now. Um, there's just way more interest in this topic than we'd anticipated, <laughs> which has been wonderful. Um, I think looking at the questions, trying to find ones to answer. I might, I might ask about um, some more strategies on handling paranoia. I know some of the questions there, and maybe that's a good one for Peter. Like what has he, Peter, what have you seen to be helpful um, in working with folks? Um. And in some not, of the not giving them any new data or any new um, stimulus. So when somebody is is um, experiencing that kind of that that stage, is you're right. Don't don't prove it or disprove it, but also just calm and quiet. And as little, um, if you can deal with two people in a room and be silent which a lot of people can't, but that's a really great place to be. They will work through it um, and, and come out the other side a lot easier. The moment you throw in a stimulus, they're gonna tie that into whatever um, environment that they have built in their head uh, that is very real to them, but not very real to the rest of us. And any stimulus you give them is going to get uh, fused into that, woven into that very complex story. Um, and there's almost, I would say that uh, um, at, at its worst, there's almost nothing you can do, at least not me as a non-clinician, uh, you know, non-professional. It, it's just, it is, um, it is a very tough place to be. And um, they need the, they just need somebody to be there and witness it and um, love them for it even still. Um, because it is it is very frightening to go through. So, um, I just have one more poll I want to do. Given how much interest there was in this, we want to find out a little bit more about what topics you'd like us to cover in the future. Um, let's see. I thought this would be easy. Let me. Okay, that is ending polling. I wanted to do my new question. If we can't, we can just enter that into the chat. Sorry, I don't want to take up the time for questions. Um, I guess keep answering questions while I try and figure out the chat. <laughs> so, um, oh, I have, how would you suggest talking to youth who are the children of people who are addicted to meth? Oh, here we go. Susan got the, the polling up. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, feel free to answer. Um, we have a, one question I, I like. How would you suggest talking to youth who are the children of people who are addicted to methamphetamine? 
It's okay if you can't answer it. Um, because of, questions. yeah, because of, of the niche of, you know, predominantly MSM and trans and, you know, the uh, various other uh, uh, populations that we kind of focus to, that's not something that I have a lot of experience with. So mm -hmm. I, have, I got nothing. Sorry about that. I think that's a, another. Yeah, yeah. I, that might be another big topic. Um, <laughs> right. What are, okay, we're right at two o'clock. There's so many great questions. I will take these down and we'll summarize them and send out responses to all the questions we received and weren't able to get. Um, it, feel free to keep answering what topics you'd like us to do future webinars on. It looks like men, methamphetamine and mental health is a strong one as well as treatment for stimulant use disorder. So I really wanna thank um, Susan and Peter for being here and doing this with me today. Um, just so appreciate both of you. And I appreciate everyone who participated. Oh, the poll only gives us the option to choose one topic for the future. Oh, shoot. I thought I had put it in multiple choice. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, thank you so much, Susan and Peter. And thank you for everyone who participated. I appreciate all of you for being here and learning with us. Thank you. And um, Susan or Allison, oh, you can yeah. feel free to uh, share my contact information when you send uh, out whatever you send out. So. Wonderful. And I love your yellow background. I don't. It, no? it, <laughs> it washes me out and does all kinds of weird things, but it's the office that I got. So it looks great. I think. But, uh, all right. Well, I'll send you along <laughs> all the questions we got because there were so many. So. OK, perfect. And Thank we had you. you as a speaker because you're 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 the expert on this. I was like, Susan, who should we have? And she's like, Peter. So. I, well, yeah, I know. And I had this, well, two things. I, how, how many people are still on a whole bunch probably? Uh, there, two things about it. Um, one is um, you. I didn't expect you guys to cover like all of my bullet points, which is fine. I'm glad it came from multiple sources. And, um, and I still haven't gotten my head around when I out myself about my drug use. It always, it, I, because, you know, anyway, um, it always kind of, you know, chokes me up a little bit, especially when I'm sitting in my desk at my office at work. Mm -hmm. It just seems so, um, you know, not right. So, <laughs> yeah, but, anyway. but it's good. It's, it's a thing a lot of people do. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And I was um, quite uh, amazed that 300 and some odd people showed up. So I think that's great. 570 people had signed up, so. Wow, 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 yeah. I see someone saying lived experience is so wonderful. Be proud of it, embrace it. So lots of positive <laughs> questions in the chat, so. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Peter. And I really, really appreciate it. And I don't, I think you and Susan covered sufficiently different things. It, just the emphasis that people need to be treated as a whole person, that their drug use <laughs> may not be the most important thing to them, so it's really good. Great. Thank right. you. Bye. My pleasure. Bye.